Ah. So hello, um, I'm the last thing between you and lunch, so I try to make this quick. Uh, my name is Anton, and for the last six years I was working as a freelance uh, Django engineer, and I was working in those years in a lot of different projects and all of, a lot of different teams. And like the biggest project, it had about one million uh, unique users a month, so it's quite big. And I learned a lot of stuff, and also made a lot of mistakes, so I wanted now, uh, tell you a story about a fictional team and their journey uh, when scaling their Django project. So, meet the team. So, on the left, it's Betty. She's our main Django backend developer. Becky worked uh, for three years in, a, in an online agency, and she did like uh, projects for small companies and like the local soccer team and stuff like this, and also a lot of uh, Django CMS-based teams. So. She knows a lot of Django, but she never did a, a, a really big project. And on the right, uh, that's Marissa. She's the management of the team. She has all the, the vision for going yeah, and disrupt the whole world. So they together founded a, a company called My Yoga Palace. And it's like a social media uh, page for yoga fans. And it has, it's, it's video focused, so everyone can upload video and you can watch other people's yoga videos, and, you, and it has all the bells and whistles of a social media site, like sharing and following. You name it, they have it. And after three months of intense work, uh, the site looked something like this. So Betty did really a, a great job in coming up with the site. And the basic layout is like the, the basic Django layout. So they have JUnicon in the center as the application server. And they use Postgres as a database, and also Nginx in the front uh, for, for serving the static files. So I just moved this away. Um, yeah, so they, they launch, and the site is very popular, and they get more and more users. And as they get more and more users, the site gets slower and slower and slower. And one day, uh, Marissa comes to Betty and says, it's just, just not working. I, I'm embarrassed by the, the speed of the site. And, I'm, I can't show it to possible partners, so we need to decide uh, to be faster. And Betty is like, yeah, OK, uh, let me see what I can do. So she installs Django Debug Toolbar. And when she goes to the start page on the front page of their site, she sees this. <laughs> so they have over 1,000 SQL queries on the front page, and that's way too much. So um, Betty is like, yeah, OK, I, I have to fix it. Um, she does some research, and she finds that there are two features in Django that are exactly for this. It's select-related and prefetch-related. And they find a great talk by Christopher Adams. Um, so she learns how to use it, and she starts refactoring her code. And she goes over all her code and applies those stuff, uh, if appropriate. And after three days, uh, Django, uh, the front page looks like this. So it's way faster. and. Still, there is quite, a, quite some queries, but Marissa is happy with the speed of the site, and Betty is also happy, and she's a little bit proud that she had achieved this. And then uh, a warm and fuzzy feeling comes up inside of Betty, and it's the achievement unlocked feeling, because she's now able to, do, um, uh, to use Django debug toolbar to just know what's going on in her code. And also, she has now the achievement of optimized queries, because she's really good now in writing fast queries. So, but a few days ago, when Betty was logging into the server via SSH, she just uh, recognized that the, the connection is very slow, or it's not very snappy. So she's not very good in all this DevOps stuff and operations and administration stuff. But a few years ago at DjangoCon, she heard of a service called New Relic and all the cool guys using it. And it's, it's like an application monitoring a service where you can um, monitor all the, the, the parts of your application, but it's also very, very expensive. But they have a, a free version that's just basic um, hardware monitoring. So Betty goes for the free version and installs it on their server, and the dashboard tells her something like this. So you see they have one server, and you see all the metrics like CPU and disk I.O. and memory are almost maxed out. So the server is about to blow up. And Betty says, yeah, OK, we need another server because one is just not enough. And also this red bar here, it's not very, very good. 
So they set up an, a new server, and Betty decides to just move the, the database on, the, on a second server to have a dedicated uh, database server, and configure Django to just connect to the other server. They set everything up, they de deploy it in a nightly session, and afterwards it looks like this. So we have now two servers, or they have two servers, the DB one and the server one, and all the metrics are down. They are not perfect, but it's, it's not red anymore, but orange, so that's a little bit better, and they have a lot of bugs to fix and other stuff to do, so they go with it. And this is how the, the system looks like right now. So they have now the second server, that's the DB1, so the blue squares are the servers, and Django is directly connecting to the Postgres server. And as Betty uh, looks at this, uh, she again gets this warm and cozy feeling, and it's because she achieved the hardware monitoring achievement. Oh. And because it's like having a system without monitoring is like driving a car blindfolded. It's just not a good idea. So you, you have to have monitoring to know what's going on. And also she has now a dedicated database server, which is always a good idea for larger projects. So Betty now has prevented the server meltdown, and now she wants to, to speed up the site. And she used Django caching uh, before, but only with like file system, um, a file system cache. That's, that's okay, but now she wants to have something really, really fast. So she installs memcached. It's basically a key value storage that runs in memory and is really fast and very easy to set up. So this is what she does. It just installs memcache and gives it a port and gives it some RAM and uh, configures Django to, to use the memcache as cache backend. And she deploys it to the site. And she's really like hoping that it will be very, really, really fast because Marissa keeps um, getting more and more users to the site. And again, the, the site is about a uh, page load takes 15 seconds and that's just too, uh, too slow. But after deploying all the caching, the site isn't getting any faster. So Betty checks, double checks all the, the configuration, if the ports are right. And, it should work, everything, but it's still slow. So Betty does a little trick in her main um, HTML template. She just adds a comment here that just prints the current uh, timestamp. So if the cache would work, this timestamp should not change because the, the page would be generated once and then delivered from cache. But after um, reloading the page a couple of times, um, she re recognizes that the, the timestamp changes, so the cache is not working at all. So she, dis she does some, some research on what's, what's going on, and after some time she finds the bad guys, and the bad guys are cookies. Because they use um, like a social media sharing widget thingy on the front end, and this has all those strange cookies, and there's one cookie in there, the third one, that's changing on every request. And so Betty um, reads a lot of documentation on how the caching is really done. And she figures that uh, Django assumes if the cookies are changing, that the, the content of the page is also a different one. So if the cookies are changing on every, on every request, Django will generate a, a cache item on every request and just that defeats the whole, the whole Django caching. And it even makes the site a little bit slower because on every request, Django has to generate the cache item, put it in the cache, but will never fetch it again. So Betty is an engineer, so she thinks, OK, cookies are a problem, so let's delete the cookies. And she writes a middleware that sits in front of the caching middleware. Uh, and her middleware just strips the cookies away, and she thinks, OK, then the cookies don't change, so caching works. Uh, she deploys it on her site, and lo and behold, it's really, really fast. And also, the, the timestamp does not change, change anymore, so it's, the cache is working. But she then uh, sees, uh, notices this over here. So that's not her username. And she's a little bit confused, so what's going on? So she tries to uh, log out, and she still sees this. And slowly, her mind just recognizes what's happening here. And she's a little bit like, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> because I stripped the cookies, just Django uh, gives everyone the same page. And this, this Gina was, by a coincidence, the, their request that, put into the, that was put into the cache, and now everyone is, is, 
getting her page. So she almost gets a heart attack, but after a few moments, she just yeah, stays a little cooler, and she deactivates caching at once and just stops memcache and everything. Um, then the site uh, goes back to very, being very, very slow, but at least it's, it's, it's delivering the, the right things. And she has to uh, refactor her, her middleware to just strip out all the cookies that are not from Django. So she keeps the CSRF token and the session ID and stuff, but strips all the tokens of the, of the widget. And she's a little bit afraid of, of just deploying it again, so she makes sure that she's testing it really, really good. So she also installs like Geunicorn and Memcache and everything on her developer machine and tests it in different browsers and with incognito mode and all kinds of stuff. And after an hour of intensive testing, she gets a little bit more confident and she can redeploy the site without breaking everything. And finally, she, uh, with sweaty hands, she runs a new, uh, deploys the new version with her updated middleware. And now, really, the the people get the right uh, pages, and also the the caching is working. So finally, she can relax a little and just lean back. And again, the achievement lock feeling comes up because she has now proper Django caching that's uh, yeah working like it should. And as it is Friday afternoon, she's like, I've broken more things today than I wanted to, so I, I don't touch anything today. I just um, keep the, the cool stuff I want to work on. She wants to work on asynchronous processing stuff uh, for Monday, so she went home, um, has a nice relaxing weekend, and on Monday she comes into the office and wants to work on uh, asynchronous stuff. But Marissa is already in the office, and she's really upset, and. Uh, she's like, the site is down, the site is down, and Betty's like, what, what, it worked. And she fires up her browser, and she, for her, it works. But Marissa is completely freaking out because they have a, a, a very important meeting later that day, and there the site must be up again. And um, yeah, because Marissa is freaking out like hell and, and asking every, every five minutes if, if the site is up again, Betty just sends her out of the room and just says, Please stay away. I need to think. I just need some time. I don't want to see you for half an hour. Um, finally, there's some, some, she can think again, Betty. So after some refreshes, she sees that this is the problem uh, Marissa was talking about. And it's, but it was only happening every 10th or 20th uh, request. So that's a little bit strange. But uh, after looking into the log files, she sees that there are um, she get this um, errors in the logs, too many clients already, or sometimes this error. So she figures out that there's some problem with the database connections, and turns out that uh, Postgres has a maximum limit of connections it can handle, and because they have so many concurrent users right now, uh, Django is just opening too many connections to the database, and that's just overwhelming the database. So Betty finds something that's called PG Bouncer, and it's it's like a, a connection pooling thing. So PG Bouncer opens connections to the database um, and keeps them open and reuses them. So it's like it's preventing um, that the database will be overwhelmed with connection attempts. And this is how they, she installs it. So here is the PG Bouncer running, and you can configure like a username and a password, and you can say, yeah, please uh, make this the the database you connect to, and here you have the, the connection pool. And in Django, you just configure Piggy Bouncer to be your database. And because it's, it's really hard to, to test something like this on a local machine, the things like no risk, no fun, just deploy it to the live system and see what's happening. And in fact, it worked. So she doesn't get the errors anymore. And she checks the log files, and the other people also, also the errors are gone. So this issue is somehow released. Uh, and she tells Marissa, and Marissa also starts to test the thing and calms a little bit down. And finally, um, Betty can get her morning coffee she wanted to grab four hours ago. So she goes into the kitchen and pours herself a coffee, and while she is doing this, again, the achievement unlock feeling comes up because she has now a proper connection pooling, and now her database is more stable than before. After the coffee, she... Uh, can finally work on the stuff she really wanted to work on that day, and that's like asynchronous processing. 
So right now everything is synchronous in their side, and they have like long-running uh, operations like users uploading a video. So this is looking something like this right now. So the, the user request comes in with the video, it's uploaded, then they do a video conversion because users have all kinds of different video formats and they convert it to one they can use. And they also like, because they want to be global and everything, they have like a service for translating the title and the descriptions of the, of the videos. They also call like a, a web service for translation. And that's, this everything here that takes very long. And after this is finished, the user gets the response. So for long videos, this doesn't work at all. They get a lot of um, timeouts and stuff. And what Betty really wants to have is something like this. So again, the, the request comes into Django, but Django just tells some asynchronous workers or someone else, not me, uh, just please uh, do the video conversion and please do the translations. And, she can, uh, and Django can uh, then respond to the user, we got your video, we are processing it, um, we will tell you if, when, it's, when it's done. So, so she, can, uh, she can do more than one thing in parallel. And as she does some research, she finds that Celery is the thing that can do this. So Celery is an async uh, task runner. Uh, yeah. And it's basically those guys over there would be Celery workers. So uh, Celery works like this. It just sits there uh, with its workers, and the workers check on a queue. And if there's a new item in the queue, one worker grabs it and works on it. And Django, if, if Django wants to, do, wants to have something done uh, asynchronously, it just puts it into the queue, and then it's done. Uh, and this queue you also have to install, so um, Betty decides to install Redis. It's like a key value um, store in, in database, and it's production ready, and it's fast, and it's easy to install, so she goes for Redis. And her setup now looks like this. So they have now on her main machine, the, the salary workers. She configures to have four workers. And like here is Redis with the queue. And by default, they have one queue that's called salary. And uh, she refactors her Django code to just put all the asynchronous tasks into the queue. And salary will grab it from the queue and work on it. And she's like now, so async all the things. So she does like um, creating thumbnails asynchronously. and translation of the, of the titles and translation of the descriptions and also the video conversion stuff. And as she learned before, you, you have to have monitoring. So she also installs Celery Flower, or Flower, I don't know how it's pronounced. And there she sees uh, her four workers, and they are all online, and they are all processing stuff, and nothing is failing, and it really works great um, for the first couple of, of days. So after two weeks, people start complaining that um, Processing of the videos takes hours or even days. So she again looks at the uh, monitoring, and she sees that here is her one queue that's called salary, because that's the default name. And there are tons and tons of, of tasks in there. So they're called messages here. So the, the workers are not able to, to work on the task faster than people put tasks in there. So she figures maybe it's, that's a stupid idea to just have one um, queue like this one, because it's, it's a bottleneck. And it would be better to have two queues, just one for the really important stuff, like converting videos, and one for the not-so-important parts, like everything else, because the videos are really important. And she also thinks that maybe uh, we should have more workers, but also like have a separate worker for the important stuff, and so dedicated workers for important stuff and dedicated worker for not important stuff. So her new... Um, Setup looks like this. She has now two more workers that are strictly for video processing. And also she has uh, two queues now, the video queue and the other stuff queue. And she had to refactor also um, code in Django to just say that the, the video uh, tasks go into the video queue and the, all the rest are going to the other stuff queue. And as you can see, it, it works. The, the queue is not very, very big. So she, she keeps monitoring it for two weeks or so, and the, the users stopped complaining about the videos being very, uh, taking very long to process. So that's, that works out. And again, she gets this one 
feeling inside of her because it's the async tasks feeling. She has now a really uh, good setup, a stable setup to do asynchronous processing. <coughs> so finally, the setup looks like this. I've now removed the disks down there, so it's, it's a little bit more readable. And Betty and Marissa have, have these status quo meetings every week. And Betty wants to um, describe the system to Marissa so she somehow knows what's going on. So yeah, there's the nginx just for handling the static files, the gunicorn, which uses the memcache for, for um, fast uh, responses, and gunicorn connects to pgbouncer as its database, and pgbouncer just manages the, the pool of connections to the Postgres database, and they also have like Celery and Redis uh, for asynchronous stuff, yeah, and Redis more for the communication between Django and Celery. And they talk about the future, and Marissa wants to know if this setup somehow can, can scale, if they're really going global. And uh, Betty's like, yeah, of course it can scale, because I did this. So if, <laughs> <laughs> if we, for, for example, the, the database hits a limit, we just uh, add another database server, and Postgres has a, a feature, it's called streaming replication, so every change on this database will be propagated to this database, so they are just in sync, and we can just configure Django uh, to, to do write operations to, to the primary database and all the read operations from the secondary database. So it would be load balancing between these two database servers. And again, if we grow, keep growing and the main server is hitting a limit, we can just move the async stuff to, to a dedicated server. And the only thing we need to do is just in in our Django config file, change one line, so it connects to this Redis here, uh, on this server, and we are set, so that now we have more power here. And further optimization would be to just move the Nginx to a separate server. So we have a dedicated application server and a web server. And if then this application server uh, is hitting the limit, if we have really, really a lot of users, uh, we can just mirror it and have another one, or another one, or another one, so two or three or four. And we just can tell Nginx to load balance between these two application servers. And that's, that's done by just adding an IP address to the config in Nginx. So that's, we are set for the next couple of months, hopefully. And as she was explaining this to Marissa, she again gets this warm and cozy feeling. But this time it's a little bit different. It's a, it's a, it's a bigger feeling because it's the, the level up feeling. And Betty is now developer level two. <laughs> and she's really, <laughs> but she, she doesn't know about this 800 show. She's really proud of what she achieved. And, and she looks back the last, uh, what she achieved the last couple of months. So this is all the stuff she did and she's quite proud. Uh, but it's also noon over there, and yeah, they are hungry, and they decide yeah, to just head out and have lunch. I think we should also do. And there's uh, the, the slides with tons of notes in it, so they are also usable without the talk. So yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for this amazing talk. We've got time for some questions, so if you have any, please queue up here. Ooh. Hi. Um, Hi. You were um, uh, using memcached and Redis. Um, yeah. I was wondering if uh, there's any, uh, being key value source, um, yeah. is there anything uh, that memcached is um, better at? compared to Redis? Um, yeah, the difference is um, Redis can do, uh, Redis stores the, the, the data to the disk every five minutes, or you can configure it. So if you have a, a crash of the server, um, the, the queue in Redis is still there. So after restart of Redis, uh, it loads it from the, from the disk, and then it's again in the, uh, in the memory. <laughs> I'm going to be evil and ask about adding sockets and web sockets to all, all that mix. Because uh, okay. <laughs> uh, if you do that, uh, 
well, the, the whole premise de depends on, on the fact that the, the backend server does not need to remember about the client, and you, you can have horizontal yeah. scaling in, in G-Unicorn, and yeah. because of memcache, you can move sessions around, yeah. and that's easy. But if you add a WebSocket connection, then suddenly you can't. Uh, what happens then, and how would you deal with this? Poo, yeah, probably if you, if you need WebSockets, then it would be a totally different thing, I think. So I think this is then useless, probably. I, I've never done a project with WebSockets, so yeah, you have to do another thing. So I don't know, really. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, that's it for the questions. Okay. Thank you very much for this great talk.